Good afternoon. I'm Andrea Young, the Executive Director of the ACLU of Georgia. As you know, when Governor Kemp signed into law a bill violating women's constitutional rights in Georgia, we promised we would see him in court. We are here today to provide a status update on our response to Georgia's abortion ban law. First, we will hear from the legal director of the ACLU of Georgia, Sean Young. Hello, my name is Sean Young and I'm the legal director of the ACLU of Georgia. Today, we filed a lawsuit challenging Georgia's ban on abortion, otherwise known as HB 481. The lawsuit was filed on behalf of Sister Song, an organization committed to reproductive justice in communities of color and other marginalized communities, and medical providers such as Feminist Women's Health Center and Planned Parenthood, whose mission is to provide women and others with the best medical care that they deserve. The legal team includes the ACLU, Center for Reproductive Rights, and Planned Parenthood Federation of America. We're asking the court to block HB 481 from going into effect before January 2020. This law is blatantly unconstitutional under 50 years of Supreme Court precedent, and every federal court to have heard a challenge to such a ban has struck it down. The 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution has long protected our cherished right to privacy and liberty. And HB 481 tramples on those basic American freedoms. But this case is also about the freedom of everyone to make their own health care decisions based on the advice of their doctors. As the lawsuit explains, HB 481 has a devastating impact on the health care of women throughout Georgia. First, HB 481 forces women to continue their pregnancies against their will which can expose many of them to serious health risks, such as heart attacks, stroke, and kidney damage, health risks that they will be powerless to address under the law. Second, HB 481 threatens OBGYNs and other doctors with severe criminal penalties for providing certain standard of care treatments, even to those who wish to carry their pregnancies to term if any of those treatments creates a risk that an embryo might be lost. And third, by threatening certain standard of care treatments and driving doctors out of the state, HB 481 will have a particularly devastating impact on Georgians of color, Georgians from rural areas, and lower income Georgians who are already least able to access medical care and who will have the least resources to navigate this law's cruelties. So we're asking the court to block HB 481 to ensure that everyone has the freedom to make their own healthcare decisions without politicians looking over their shoulder and the freedom to decide for themselves when to start or expand a family. I'm happy to take any questions about the lawsuit at the end of this conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. We are grateful to the plaintiffs in this lawsuit for the work they do every day to make reproductive freedom a, a reality for countless women in Georgia and for their personal commitment and courage. First, we'll hear from Monica Simpson, the executive director of Sister Song, the National Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collaborative. Monica. Good afternoon, my name is Monica Simpson and I am excited to be able to stand before you today as the Executive Director of Sister Song, a National Reproductive Justice Collective for Women of Color that has been based here in Atlanta, Georgia for over 20 years. Whenever Governor Kemp signed into law House Bill 481, he made a very clear message. He made it clear that he was not centering the needs of the most marginalized in this state. He made it clear that he was not committed to the principles of reproductive justice. He made it clear that he wasn't worried about all of the other numerous policy actions that we know that we need in this state, like expanding Medicaid or addressing our rising maternal health crisis in this state or addressing the fact that we have over 70 counties without an OBGYN. And we can go on and on and on about what the people of Georgia need to be able to survive and thrive and live their best lives in this state. As a reproductive justice organization, we work tirelessly every day to secure the human right to have the children that we want, 
to not have children and to prevent or end pregnancies without shame and with dignity and safely and legally, and to be able to parent the children that we have in healthy and safe environments without any interruption of those who do not have our best interests of our children at heart, and we fight every day for the right, our human right to bodily autonomy and to self-determination and to be able to make our own decisions for ourselves and our families. So we're making a clear message here today as well as a plaintiff in this case. We're making it clear that our organized resistance is what is going to win. It is our duty to win. We are committed to making sure that in the state of Georgia that racism, white supremacy, patriarchy, sexism, any other forms of oppression have no place in our policy making because it does not, it, 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 it impacts our people in negative ways. We are making it clear that we are centering black, brown, indigenous, queer, trans, young people, all folks across different gender binaries and sexualities in our work. We are making it clear that we know that Georgians didn't ask for this and that we are going to push forward for what we know is best for our state. I know it might be weird for some folks to think about an advocacy organization stepping into this role as a plaintiff, but it is our duty as reproductive justice to make sure that we are standing firm in our principles and values and holding fast to what we know is going to be extremely important for the lives of those living in this state. So we look forward to seeing Governor Kemp in court, and we look forward to continuing to push reproductive justice across this state and this nation so that we know and we can ensure that everyone's human right to their own self-determination, to their own ability to make their own decisions about their reproductive lives is secured. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Monica. The, uh, our next speaker will be Kwajalein Jackson, the executive director of the Feminist Women's Health Center, uh, and be, please be very clear that we are Georgia-based organizations serving the people of Georgia for at least 50 years. Uh, and so these, this is, these are messages from people who serve and are supported by and are very integral to our communities here in the state of Georgia. Kwajalein? My name is spelled K W A J E L. YN, and I have plenty of business cards for anyone who needs that again later. My name is Kwajalein Jackson, and I'm the executive director of Feminist Women's Health Center. We've been proudly providing abortion care and comprehensive reproductive health care in Atlanta for over 42 years, and we will continue to do so. With the filing of this complaint, we want to remind the governor's office and the state legislature that you work for us. That your responsibility is to respond to the needs of your constituents and to be sensitive to the stories that they have, to recognize their lived experiences and use that to inform the laws that you enact and that you uphold. We want to remind our policymakers that we are not going anywhere that we will continue these fights, that we know that this is not the, the last time that our humanity will be attacked through policy, and that we remain steadfast in our opposition to anything that challenges our pursuit of reproductive justice. We will not accept any law that dehumanizes us in an attempt to assign humanity to cells that are growing inside of us. I want the state to recognize that the majority of Georgia is with us, and we are only growing more powerful the more they try to push us back. Liberation is in our sight, and we will not be moved from our focus towards liberation. I am honored to stand united with Sister Song, with Planned Parenthood Southeast, with ACLU of Georgia, with Summit Medical Center, with Atlanta Women's Center, with CARE-FM, with Atlanta Comprehensive Wellness Center, with Columbus Women's Health, and all the other physicians and providers who have joined in this complaint, who are boldly saying, not on our watch. I also stand with the indomitable coalition of folks on the ground, women engaged, Georgia NARAL, National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum, Sister Love, Unite, United for Reproductive and Gender Justice, Spark Reproductive Justice Now, and Access Reproductive Care Southeast. 
We are the people who will remain undaunted in this fight. We are the people who will continue to uplift the lives of people of color, of marginalized communities, of queer and trans folks in the face of anyone who would come to attack their well-being. We are honored to be represented by ACLU, Center for Reproductive Rights, and Planned Parenthood Federation, who will be boldly um, dismantling this law in the courts. And we challenge um, legislatures to try this again. We know we will be victorious, and when we win, we want our supporters to be ready for the next attacks that come. We will only grow stronger as they attempt to push against us. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, for standing with us. We are grateful to Georgia. Thank you, Kwajalein. And everyone's name and organization is in the press release and in the press advisory uh, that's also on the ACLU website. Uh, next, we will hear from one of the iconic organizations in this fight, uh, Stacy Fox, president of Planned Parenthood Southeast. Stacy. Thank you, Andrea. My name is Stacy Fox, and I'm the president and CEO of Planned Parenthood Southeast. And we work across Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi, where we have seen these abortion bans sweep through this spring. I would be remiss this morning if I didn't take a moment to hold some space for Marche Jones, a woman in Alabama who is literally facing the impact of these historical, deep-seated, patriarchal attacks on pregnant women. This spring, Georgians came out in opposition to HB 481 like we have never seen before. Hundreds of Georgia citizens packed the halls of the state capitol for weeks on end. More than 300 Georgia business leaders spoke out publicly against this ban. The medical community came out in united opposition against HB 481. And the $9 billion film and in entertainment industry had continued to speak out against HB 481. And more than 6,000 Georgians signed a petition urging Governor Kemp to veto this bill just hours after he signed the bill. Georgia politicians heard from us, they just didn't listen. In fact, at the bill's signing, Representative Ed Setzler said that things would go back to normal once the shrill attacks of the opposition sort of fade into the background. Well, Representative Setzler, what you don't know is that we are not backing down and we will not be silent because we made some promises and we aim to keep them. To the countless Georgians who spoke out against this ban and were ignored, we promise to keep fighting every step of the way and today proves that we are. To the politicians who voted for this ban, we promise to hold you accountable and we are coming for you. To our partners, we promise that we are in this together and we are here today, locked arms, ready to fight this unconstitutional ban with everything we have. To Governor Kemp, we promised we would see you in court and we did that this morning. And most importantly, to our patients, to all of our patients and all of the people that we represent today, we promised to protect access to safe and legal abortion. And what we want you to hear from us today is that every day our collective doors stay open so that you can access the quality, compassionate, non-judgmental health care that you deserve. And that includes access to safe and legal abortion. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Stacey. Now we will take questions. Sean, do you want to come back over? We'll take questions if you have questions. What is the next step? An injunction, a temporary restraining order? What happens next? So now that we file this lawsuit, we will be filing a motion soon thereafter asking the court to block this ban from going to effect well in advance of the January 2020 date. Based on your types of lawsuits. What is the time frame you're looking at as the law is scheduled to take effect in January of 2020, but, but this, this court action would stop it? And what is the time frame then that you anticipate before everything's resolved one way or the other? Uh, that's a great question. As a lawyer, I really cannot 
uh, make predictions about how quickly a court will rule, but you better believe we're going to ask the court to rule sufficiently in advance of January 2020. Right on track, or maybe even a little bit early. Talk about the process in getting this uh, lawsuit filed. And uh, Ms. Jones, you mentioned, who were, who is the person that's most affected by this that you filed through? Um, as with all civil rights lawsuit, the lawyers work around the clock to put together our legal claims. But they, these lawsuits are not possible without the brave plaintiffs who come forward standing up for causes that some quarters may find very unpopular. And it is only because of the courage of our clients that these lawsuits can happen. This law is a similar law that was passed here that passed in several other states. Do you all know the states that they've been passed in and what courts have done with those laws? Every single federal court that has heard a challenge to this kind of an abortion ban has struck it down. Is that positive for you that, that, that this is something that's been struck down that many times already? Uh, I think it's very telling that the federal judiciary is living up to its duty and obligation to protect and defend the Constitution, and that's all we're asking this court to do this year. Part of the lawsuit deals with the fetal personhood language in HB 481. Can you talk a little bit about the legal arguments you're making uh, in regards to that piece of the bill? The entirety of HB 481 is designed to allegedly legally justify the abortion ban. The only reason that we see all these different Frankenstein pieces of the law is so that lawmakers could justify the abortion ban. But luckily, politicians cannot rewrite the Constitution. So whatever they may try to do, we will protect and defend the Constitution in court. And that means every single part of HB 481 must be struck down. Like fetal personhood. Have you already seen an effect? Even though this law does not go into effect until January 1st, have you already seen an impact just with the signing? Sure. Thank you for that. Absolutely, we've seen an impact, right? We have questions that come in to our offices, especially, I'm, I'm pretty sure, to um, those who are service providers who are also plaintiffs in this case. People are unsure. They want to know, can I still have my procedure done? People are scared about what this means for them um, and in the future. How is this going to affect me beyond this? So there is a level of fear. There's a level of concern that's really prominent right now among the people of Georgia. And I've said this in a lot of other spaces, you know, as a black woman that has grown up and lived her entire life in the South, it is, we do not want to return to a day where the state has control of our bodies, where the state makes decisions for us on behalf of our own reproductive decision making. And so that is what people are concerned about in Georgia, is that how do we make sure we're living in a state where we have autonomy, where we have the ability to make our own decisions for ourselves. And measures like House Bill 481 is taking us into a very scary place where it seems as if folks will have that stripped away from them. So, yes, there has been a lot of concern from our community, and those are the stories that we hold as an organization. Sure. The lawsuit very uh, completely summarizes a lot of the arguments, social arguments and medical arguments, for opposing this legislation. Uh, did you ever think we'd be reopening a debate that maybe we thought Roe versus Wade and all the decisions since might have settled specifically in regard to what you addressed is the when does life begin argument that that the opponent or the supporters of this bill bring up in defending it um, for nearly 50 years the u.s supreme court has made it clear that the 14th amendment to the united states constitution protects our cherished right to liberty and privacy and that includes the ability of someone to decide for themselves when to start or expand their family and make their own health care decisions. This is an integral feature of the United States Constitution, and whether they challenge it 50 years ago, today, or in the future, all of us will be there every step of the way to protect and defend the Constitution. For many folks, this feels like it's unprecedented. It feels like it is a shock to the system. But for people who've been working in reproductive health rights and justice, this is par for the course. We, these kinds of attacks on our liberty have been unrelenting over the past several decades. So these same questions, the tactics may change, the nuanced language may change, but the dehumanization and the denial of our bodily autonomy remain 
remains the same. And so until we address, as Monica so aptly put, patriarchy, racism, white supremacy, and the things that are underlying, these kinds of attacks will contain, continue to persist. And we will continue to fight them at every step. I think I would just jump in and say that obviously we saw this company with the confirmation of Justin Kavanaugh and under this current administration. And if anybody thinks that access to safe and legal abortion is not closely tied to voter suppression, then they weren't paying attention to what happened here last fall in Georgia. And if you also don't think that access to safe and legal abortion isn't going to be front and center on the ballot next fall, you also aren't paying attention. That's correct. That's right. That's right. Uh, yep. Yeah. So the ACLU was involved from the very beginning with Doe v. Bolton. My mentor, Margie Hames, argued the Georgia Companion case to Roe v. Wade. Uh, and as, a, as someone who grew up in the civil rights movement, we know freedom is a constant struggle. As Kwajalein said, the underlying impetus for many of these measures still remains in our society, and it's what we fight at the ACLU every day. The Supreme Court just refused to hear Alabama's rebuttal to their abortion ban being struck down. Have you all been tracking that case? And what do you see that as some type of indicator of what may happen here if it gets that high up to the Supreme Court? I can't speculate about how courts will issue rulings in the future. But what I can tell you is that we're going to be there every step of the way to protect and defend the Constitution, no matter what court we appear before. And the Supreme Court and all of the lower courts have sworn an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution. And that's all we're asking them to do. And I would just say we, we have absolutely been tracking this bill. We've been in federal court a number of times with the state of Alabama today. And today, the state of Alabama owes the ACLU of Alabama $2 million <laughs> from defending this case, money that the state of Alabama doesn't have and should be putting into things like cervical cancer, where women, black women, are dying at six times the rate of black women in any other state. That's where they should be spending this money. So we've been tracking that money, um, or that, I'm sorry, we've been tracking uh, that bill for sure, and we're excited to hear that news today. I will also tell you that our partners at the ACLU, our partners at the Center for Reproductive Rights, and our lawyers and our litigation and law team are the best in the business. That's right. We haven't lost in court yet, and we don't plan to now. That's right, that's right. And is, uh, is recovering of, of fees like that some possibility here in Georgia? I mean, might uh, Georgia be writing a check also? Well, as we said when HB 481 was up for debate, that this bill potentially will cost taxpayers millions of dollars in legal fees. Generally, in these civil rights actions, we are entitled to seek legal fees if we prevail in court. And so I think the real question is, uh, why are Georgia politicians wasting taxpayer dollars on these kinds of lawsuits when they should be spending those dollars on protecting the maternal health of all Georgians. Well, thank you very much. If there are no more questions, we, uh, we appreciate it. Uh, the media telling this story and listening to these voices uh, that are coming from our Georgia community. Thank you.